Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Andreas Kontaxis and I'm a research scientist in shoulder biomechanics. Over the last 10 years, my work is focused on uh, shoulder modeling and especially investigating the properties of the joint replacement. Today, I'm going to show a summary of research that is uh, the basis of the development of the virus prosthesis. As an introduction, they, I'm going to uh, say about the shoulder mechanism, which is a complex mechanism. It consists from three bones, the clavicle, the scapula, and the humerus. And all these bones are moving together in order to provide a, a large range of motion for the arm. Um, as a result, the shoulders are extremely mobile, but they are not very strong structures. The shoulder is a very complex uh, joint, and there are many muscles acting together in order to provide motion to the shoulder complex. The glenoid is the articulation surface of the humerus. Uh, the shape of it is very small and shallow in order to allow, to allow a large range of rotation. The prime muscles of the, of the shoulder is the deltoid muscle that is pulling the arm up, the, the pectoralis and the latissimus dorsis that they pull the, up, the arm forwards and backwards. And they are very strong and large muscles and they provide a big range of motion. There are a, another set of muscles though that they provide, they provide stability and they are called the rotator cuff muscles. These are the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus and the subscapularis muscles. They are, locating, they are located very close to the glenohumeral joint and they are structured in order to provide stability to the joint. Their main function is when the prime muscles are contracting, their main function of the rotator cuff muscles is to co-contract in order to pull the humerus into the glenoid and hold the joint together. But it's not only the stability that the rotator cuff muscles are responsible for, they are also uh, help the motion of the arm. So you have the supraspinatus that is helping the deltoid to lift the arm up, and you have also the other rotator cuff muscles that they help rotating the arm. Unfortunately, rotator cuff tears is something very frequent, frequent in elderly population with arthritic shoulders. So what is the problem with rotator cuff tears? Uh, over the last years, there are plenty of clinical data to report that uh, when there is a tear uh, on the supraspinatus, subscapularis or infraspinatus, uh, there is a superior increase of the shear forces that suppress the glenoid, uh, the glenoid um, phase. We tried to investigate the biomechanical properties of the uh, rotator cuff tears by using an interactive shoulder model. The model also predict increased shear forces and less compressive forces on the shoulder joint. And as a result, the model predicts a, a possible superior migration of the, of the humeral head. And actually, we have clinical data to support the results of the model. Uh, clinical data that they say uh, joins with a chronic rotator cuff disease, um, there is a superior migration of the humeral head and erosion of the superior face of the glenoid. The inverse total shoulder orthopathy for a tear solution is not uh, some, um, a new idea. There are, uh, the first designs were a fully constrained designs, but it was uh, in 1996 where the Gramon inverse design um, have gained popularity for the management of the, um, to treat uh, irreparable rotator cuff tears. Uh, the idea of the Gramon design that was uh, materialized in a delta three prosthesis and produced by the Puy uh, consists of a, a hemisphere that is attached to the glenoid and a humeral cup that replaces the, uh, the humeral head. Uh, this, speci this specific prosthesis has been used for many years and clinical data so far report a very good shoulder functionality and a very good joint stability. But there are also problems, problems that usually refer into impingement. So the question is, how do we, do we investigate and how can Im we can improve the reverse anatomy design? In order to do that, we used an interactive shoulder model, the Newcastle shoulder model. It was very critical to actually being able to represent the reverse anatomy design and um, 
and we try to do a virtual surgery in order to get in depth, to investigate in depth um, the effect of the alignment of the implantation. The model works with inverse dynamics and as the figure in the slides um, shows, what the model can do is if you give the model an input of a predefined motion, then it can predict the stability and the joint contact forces and also can predict the range of motion and possible impingement. This is one more slide that is uh, illustrating how the model is working, where the video shows a capture, a video recording of a, a real subject. Um, we use uh, state-of-the-art motion analysis equipment in order to record motion and then import it to the model. In order to have realistic mo data for the, for the model to analyze, what we have done is to record reverse anatomy uh, prosthetic subjects. Um, they ha we have recorded the 10 activities of daily living uh, as been have proposed by the literature. After analyzing all the data with uh, the biomechanical model, it was straightforward to see the advantages and disadvantages of an inverse design. One of the main points is that the inverse design changes the anatomy of the shoulder and medializes the center of rotation of the arm. This has a result on the moment arm of the deltoid and, of course, the performance of the deltoid. Now the deltoid can do more with the same effort. Another advantage of the reverse design is that uh, the center of rotation is on the fixation plate. This minimizes any bedding stresses and, of course, uh, it helps for the long-lasting fixation of the prosthesis. And, of course, one of the major advantages of the inverse prosthesis is that it restores the stability uh, of the joint. Now, the glenoid sphere that is attached to the glenoid provides a large surface which resists the upward pulling of the deltoid. Analyzing further the loading results, we can compare and we can see the differences between a normal shoulder and inverse anatomy shoulder. Uh, what we can see is that when you have a shoulder doing activities of daily living, the main load on the glenoid is the compression load. And that's thanks to the rotator cuff muscles that they're always compressing and holding the joint together. When you do have a reverse inverse anatomy prosthesis where the rotator cuff muscles are not functioning, the loading on the glenoid is completely different. Now we can see that dominant force is not a compressive anymore, but you have a very large shear forces. Superior, forces. superior shear forces are the dominant shear forces, but depending on the activity, you can get a very large anterior posterior shear forces as well. And also the picture can show you a demonstration of how uh, large distribution of the contact forces are on the glenoid sphere. This knowledge is, is very important in order to design the glenoid fixation. And it's important because when you design a, a glenoid uh, component, uh, you have to design the direction of the fixation screws in order to take most of the load. But as I said previously, the inverse anatomy prosthesis is not all about advantages. There are some also bad news. And notching problem is one of the most frequent implications and is the most frequent implication that is recorded in the clinical data. Um, the post show that there is development of notches, which is loss of bone underneath the, uh, the, the glenoid sphere, uh, after long-term use of the prosthesis. We are not uh, exactly sure what causes the uh, bone notches, but uh, we assume that it can be a factor of uh, mechanical contact of the cup with the bone, uh, or it can be due to the high stresses uh, in the joint, or it can be even created by polyethylene wear uh, particles. Uh, simulations of the model clearly show a contact between the humeral cup and the bone. What we do know for sure is that if these notches can progress 
they can cause um, loosening of the glenoid and then in this case uh, revision is needed. The simulations of the model uh, due to impingement have shown some patterns of notches both on the scapula and on the prosthesis. And comparing this data with the cadaveric studies in the literature, we have found that the shape and the size of the notches are very similar to the predictions of the model. That gave us great confidence that we are in the right direction and the model is giving us the right predictions. So the next step, it was actually to try to optimize the design of the prosthesis. In the market now, there are main designs that they follow the Gramond, the original Gramond idea, but they try to modify the parameters, the design parameters slightly in order to avoid um, the impingement problem. Uh, looking at the market, uh, with the model, we, do, we did virtual changes and we tested most of these design parameters. Uh, these design parameters was the shape of the, sp of the glenoid sphere, the size and the cup depth uh, of the sphere, and also the next shaft angle of the, of the humeral stem. I'm not going to refer into all the parameters, but I'm going to give you a couple of examples. One of the most popular uh, solutions that uh, other designs have done, it was to alter the shape of the sphere. So instead of attaching a half sphere to the glenoid, they have attached a bigger portion of the sphere of the on the glenoid. This is a very effective way of reducing the impeachment and the, showed, and the model showed some very good results. But the problem is always with the stability and with the stresses on the joint. Because you have this offset and because you have a lateralized center of rotation now, the, the shear forces on the glenoid can create great bending moments that can actually create um, fracture stresses on the uh, fixation. Another example of a design parameter is the size and the depth, the size of the shear and the depth of the of the cup. Reducing in general, reducing the, the depth of the cup, you can avoid impingement. Probably this is the uh, one of the most significant factors that affect impingement. Unfortunately this is also a great factor that, uh, in terms of joint stability. The more shallow the cup is, the less the stability. Uh, of course, you can see that these two factors, the stability and the impingements, are antagonistic factors. Uh, but the model suggests that there is an optimum, an optimum that you can balance the problem out. So you can choose a size and a cup, a size of the sphere, and a cup depth, in order to uh, have maintain stability, but also reduce uh, the impingement. But it's not only about the design of the prosthesis. You can optimize also the implantation of the prosthesis. We know that the surgeons usually try to alter the implantation technique and try out. Um, Fix it, uh, fixing the prosthesis in a slightly different way. Uh, the fixation parameters that we have tested with the model, it was the positioning of the sphere on the glenoid, uh, how to rim the glenoid, and of course how to position the, the humeral stem um, on the humerus. Again, I'm going to give a, a simple example on, on how the fixation can actually affect the results. And uh, the inferior fixation of the glenoid sphere is probably one of the best results that I can show you. Uh, the, most inferior the most inferior placement of the sphere has great results to the impingement. Um, the model shows that starting from the central of the glenoid and placing the glenoid, the cl placing the sphere inferiorly by three to four millimeters, you can reduce the impingement by 50%. But there are limitations, and the limitations are coming from the size of the glenoid. As I said, glenoid is, has a very small boundaries, and by moving the sphere, by placing the sphere in fairly, you can expose the fixation screws. Also, there is a, a deltoid elongation, a deltoid stressing that is associated with placing the sphere in fairly. And this can cause actually damage to the auxiliary nerve that causes the deltoid. 
So the question is, how do you optimize the design? How do you optimize these parameters? As I mentioned, stability and impingement are usually antagonistic factors, and by trying to minimize impingement, you also reduce the stability of the joint. What we have seen from the results of the models, we have seen that not all the design factors or not all the uh, fixation factors uh, affect the uh, stability and impingement with the same way. So the way to do it, it was we have to find which of the parameters affect uh, the most and we try to optimize this in order to a new design. The design of the proximal support and the humeral cup have been developed with um, the design and development of two asymmetric oval shapes in order to provide enough plastic material to support that support the um, uh, large superior, for, uh, superior forces that uh, a reverse inverse design can generate. Also, material has been removed from the site of impingement without compromising the stability. An optimal offset from the stem has been chosen in order to maximize the moment of moment arm of the deltoid and maximize in total the functionality of the prosthesis. Of course, the virus prosthesis has not been designed only as an inverse prosthesis. The same principles that have been applied for the inverse design have been also applied for the anatomical design. As a focus of the development of the whole design was the fixation of the glenoid, because the glenoid now is a common part for both inverse and anatomical. So there is a metal bag that can be fitted and takes the uh, large stresses with four directional flexible screws. In this metal bag you can fix either the plastic anatomical design or you can fit the glenoid sphere. The virus prosthesis has been designed with, modulum, with modular parts and interchangeable parts. So the surgeon will be able to change from an anatomical to inverse design depending on the case. This has been achieved by having a lot of common modular parts uh, which the surgeon can easily interchange.